I was asked to do a best man speech in Ireland by my closest friend. And the, uh, the pride, the gratitude I had lasted about three and a half minutes until I realized I had to stand in front of hundreds of people and speak. It wasn't the fear of public speaking necessarily that scared me so much. It was that ultimately I didn't believe I had the right to stand in front of another human being and say anything, never mind make a speech. The reality is that I didn't believe that I deserved to stand in front of other people. My worst nightmare came through when I went to the venue, and the venue happened to be an old theater. And the theater had a stage. My worst nightmare. And then I hear that the speeches are taking part from the stage. And I promise you, I wanted to puke on the spot. And that didn't change for the weeks leading up to the wedding. And when I finally came to that day, somewhere something happened. I don't know what it is. Some people would say it's courage. Some people say stupidity. I don't know. But what I did was I let go of trying to be funny, trying to do something to be clever, trying to stand out. In other words, I got out of my goddamn head, and I just felt what I needed to do on that stage on that day. When I got on that stage, okay. <clears throat> when I got on that stage, something happened, and I just basically started to speak, I suppose to some extent, what we would commonly refer to as my truth. I started to share how I felt about the bride and the groom. And I just let go. I let go of all the slides, all the different things, all the intellectual thought processes that I thought I needed to do to try and stand out, to try to be clever, to try to, to be something that I wasn't. And I just, spoke from, I just spoke my truth. At one point, I think I teared up. Best men are not meant to tear up necessarily at weddings in Ireland, for sure. So what ended up happening is, at the end of my speech, I got this overwhelming standing ovation. And some people would say, wow, that must have been absolutely incredible. By the way, there's no clock on, which is fantastic, because I'm just going to keep going for about three hours. <laughs> um, and I got this overwhelming standing ovation. And people almost said, wow, that must have been so extraordinary. Your first time as a human being, standing on a stage, and you got a standing ovation. I nearly died. I wanted the ground to open up, and I wanted it to swallow me. I was so embarrassed. I was so mortified. Not because I was afraid of being on that stage as a speaker. I didn't believe I deserved to be on that stage. I didn't believe I deserved any recognition on this earth, because my confidence was on the floor. I didn't necessarily believe that I was a very good person, and I certainly didn't believe that I had a message for the planet. No one was going to send me a message from the future back to today and say, McKernan, maybe you're part of this puzzle. Maybe you're one of the archangels that actually may make a difference. I, I, near, I didn't know what to I just wanted to go home. I came off that stage, and I walked down into the, into the, into the, into the I was going to say the audience, but into the, into the, the, the people, and, and, and trust me, Irish weddings are obscenely big. I mean, not as big as this, but they're big. There's hundreds of people. And people were hugging me, and people were crying, and it was carnage. And I was thinking, shit, I just fucked it all up. <laughs> and amongst the strangers, and most of these people, I had no idea who they were, this man walked straight up to me. I'd never seen this man in my entire life before, and I've never seen him since. And he walked up, and he put his arms around me with tears rolling down his face, and he says, if I ever get married, will you be my best man? <laughs> I swear to God, that's what he said to me. Do you know what I said back to him? I, and if this is kind of what we do in Ireland. I looked at him and I said, will you fuck off? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, you've got a gift. He said, you've got a gift. And there was the first time anyone had ever said that to me. Do you think I accepted it? Took it on and said, yeah, of course I do. 
No. Absolutely not. But the one thing I will say is that sometimes it's a complete stranger that says something to us that just makes a little shift, that just changes the goalpost just a little bit. Because our parents and our friends and our colleagues and all the people that love us, they're connected to the outcome. So when they tell us something, they offer us something, we kind of dismiss it because they say, oh, they just want the best for us. But I'd be lying to say it didn't make some impact on me. I'd also be lying if I said, oh, the day I heard that, I went, great, I'm going to become a speaker. I'm going to attempt to inspire people. Shit, I didn't do that for years. Because what I hadn't dealt with was the voice inside. There wasn't just a voice saying you're not good enough, that who's going to listen to you? It was actually a belief. It was beyond a belief. It was a feeling. It was part of my DNA. It was many years later before I had the courage and people had the courage to believe in me, to put me on a stage, to do what I do now. I believe now that I've had time to sit with this, that I've had time to process this, that I've traveled to 80 countries around the world, had the pleasure and the honor and the privilege to speak to many, many people and work with them in, in many different capacities, in a coaching capacity and others, that we all have a gift. It's not for the mutually exclusive. It's not for the wealthy. It's not for the celebrities. It's not even for the authors, the speakers and the writers that with respect are here today or anywhere else in the world. It's everybody in this audience. It wasn't long ago that I sat in an audience like this and looked at the likes of Robin Sharma and, and Seth Godin and people like this, and I said, Jesus, imagine I've been like them. Imagine if I had their ability, if I had their stories or even Seth's cool yellow glasses. <laughs> Imagine if I was given that ability. What is a gift? I believe the gift is our inherent ability to impact another human being. And I'm not talking their bank balance, and I'm not talking about helping them build a property or a house or a wall. I'm talking about our ability to move another human being at an emotional level, to make them feel good about themselves, to make them feel wanted, feel connected. There's not a human being in this room that doesn't have that inherent gift, I believe. What makes our gift unique is the lens in which we look through it, and that is our story. So if you want to, and the, the, one of the challenges for me and many people in this world is I spent many years executing my talent, but never honoring my gift. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I was very good in business in certain areas, and that was my talent. I thought it was my passion, but it wasn't. My gift lies somewhere else. And I'm not, I don't speak about me and my gift as if it's something that's very... I, I don't speak a lot about it, because I think it's one of these things that we shouldn't necessarily overly self-identify. I also believe if I have a gift, which is up to you and people around me to decide whether I do or not, I think it's on loan. I'm not a religious person, but I am a very spiritual person in many ways. I think it's on loan until the day I die or the day I start abusing it. The day I die or the day I start abusing it. In other words, my ego gets in the way and it becomes about looking good and feeling good and not giving a shit about people. If you want to align your gift to who you are as a person, I don't believe there's any greater way than actually aligning it to your individual story. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. Or not, as the case may be. Here's a guy. Some of you in the audience know Tim Collins. When I met Tim Collins in the before shot here, and I'm not trying to take credit for this, Tim gives me way too much credit, and so does Giovanni for that matter, I play a very, very small role in a much bigger picture. The clients do the work. The clients, the individuals, the beautiful souls who step into my, they do it, I don't, okay? So I'm not up here saying, hey, look what I did, because that's bullshit. This is, I met Tim, and Tim didn't have a lot of value in his own skin. But one thing he did know is that he didn't enjoy what he did. He didn't like living where he was living, and he wasn't really in alignment with who he was as a person. And sometimes I meet people, and by the way, I was one of these people, so don't take this as a judgment, that when I figure out my passion, when I figure out what I'm meant to do, when I figure out what makes me happy, then, and then only will I make a change. But my big invitation is to act upon what you know as opposed to what you do not. 
In other words, if you're misaligned in an area, I'm asking you to consider making a change. What would happen? You create not just physical, not just mental, but you create emotional space for maybe the gift, which is a whisper to start to purr, to start to move into a, a conversation, and dare I say it, turn into a roar. The problem with a gift is that when it consumes you, when it grabs you, when it grabs hold of you, you cannot do anything else. There is no other option. And the thing about a gift is, whether you like this or not, whether you believe this or not, your gift, when you execute it, has got one outcome and one outcome only. It has to move people in a positive way. It has to. It has to do some good in the world. Not for everybody. So some people like what I do, like what I speak about. Some people think I'm an asshole. That's fine, whatever. Okay? But it, it has this ability to move the needle for people. So when you, incur, when, you, when you uncover and understand and unleash your gift in the world, it's not about you. It's about its impact and potential impact on other people around you. Tim Collins, one of his challenges was he suffered massively from anxiety. And the anxiety would get in the way of him making a transition, making a move, making a change in his life. What does he do today? He didn't just change his physical body, he changed his emotional you know, outlook and life, his thought process, his mindset. You know, um, Robin talked about, you know, heart set. I actually call my, you know, what, my version of it is soul set. He didn't just change the mental game, he changed the emotional game. 20 years from now, I believe we're going to be reading many books, a lot of research of how overrated mindset is. I don't mean it's not important, I just think it's a little bit overrated. He now runs an anxiety podcast, and now he's helping people using his gift through the lens of his story because he can empathize and connect like no one else can connect around anxiety because he's lived it. I believe your gift is in the pain. It's in what you've, what's hurt you, what hurts you today. Because if, if there's no outlet for that pain, if that pain doesn't have a purpose, what was the point? What was the point? The pain has to have a purpose. And maybe it's still too raw for you right now. Whatever you've experienced, whether you've lost somebody in your life, maybe you're depressed, maybe you know somebody that's depressed, maybe it feels a little bit raw to suggest that maybe you're experiencing that pain for a reason. But that is ultimately what I'm suggesting. I'm not saying you deserve it, I don't want it for you, but you have two choices. You either accept that that might be a possibility and you have an opportunity, and a possibility to take that pain, harness it, project it out, outside of you to help other people, or, or you live with it, and you hold on to it, and it grabs you and stifles you and holds you down, holds you back, and smothers your ability to connect with other people, including yourself. I would say if Tim was here beside me, the biggest transition wasn't his physical body. His biggest transition wasn't necessarily making the leap of faith, executing, starting a podcast. His biggest, his biggest challenge wasn't stepping on a stage. His biggest challenge was believing that he deserved to make an impact in this world. And when he started to work on that, and he's still working on it, so am I. I still want to puke every time I get on a stage. Sorry guys in the front here, but seriously, I do. And I'm not embarrassed to admit that. I was so nervous because I care so deeply, not just about Giovanni, but about people. It's okay to be scared. It's more than okay to be scared. And to think that you can eradicate the fear and then do something, good luck with that strategy. Good luck with that strategy because that fear, that bastard fear, turns into something else. It morphs, it never leaves you. So he's making an impact. Let's bring it a bit closer to home. This gentleman here, some of you know him. I had the pleasure of spending some time in, in Ireland with Giovanni um, last year or so, so on and so forth. This is taken outside a pub, and yes, Giovanni drank Guinness, okay? This whole thing of clean living and all that, this, this thing he pretends, bullshit, he was drinking Guinness, I saw him. Okay, so don't buy into that crap, okay? On Facebook, I just drink cucumber juice and everything. He was drinking beer in Ireland, I'm telling you. Trust me, I'm Irish. However, when he, when he was in Ireland, he was... 60 pounds heavier, not because of the Guinness, even though I'm sure that helped, 60 pounds heavier than he is today. And not dissimilar to Tim, Giovanni took on this journey of not just changing his own physicality, his own emotional state, his own mindset, and so on and so forth. But now he's starting to honor his gift. Do you think Giovanni's gift is putting an event like this together, strategically getting the speakers, 
marketing, organizing the seating and everything else. You think that's his gift? No. He has everybody doing that for him. His gift is helping people connect. His, his gift is making people feel special. His gift is bringing people together so they feel belonging, they feel long for, they feel part of something, whether it's externally or internally. I believe that's what Giovanni's gift is. He then brings a team together to put the logistics together. And that's talent. He might be good at this stuff, but his gift lies deeper. It lies further down. Let's talk about passion for a second, because this is one area that I appreciate one could argue we're saying the same thing. But I, the problem with passion, it's now being slapped on so many things. I'm passionate about widgets. I'm passionate about motorbikes. I'm passionate about wine. I'm passionate about coffee. I'm passionate about rabbits. I'm passionate about whatever. And the problem with that is that we're passionate about everything, and yet we wonder that in 10 or 15 or 20 years later, we just, we just feel that, oh, I mean, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? Why do I feel, no matter what I achieve, it's just not enough? The reason is because you haven't looked in the mirror and realized no matter what you achieve, it's not enough because you're not enough. I have a statement that I believe to my core. If there was one thing I could give the world, it's this statement. But it's more importantly what it means. And that is we give ourselves what we feel we deserve. We give ourselves what we feel we deserve. If I don't feel I'm good enough to stand on the stage, do you think I'm going to allow that to happen naturally or organically? Absolutely not. I'm going to do all sorts of shit to get in my way. I'm going to sabotage it. I'm going to ensure that it doesn't happen, whether I'm conscious of that or not. Whether I'm even conscious of that or not. This is something that Giovanni wrote and sent to me. Philip, I just realized that every extra pound of fat on my body is a problem I haven't addressed, a difficult conversation I've been avoiding, and a demon I haven't battled. Giovanni's not standing on this stage right now, not yet, so he could disagree with me. But my belief is that he dealt on the inner stuff, the stuff that a lot of us don't see the value in. A lot of us say, hey, when I build my business, then I'll come back and deal with this inner stuff. When I make enough money and have the freedom, then I'll come back and deal with this inner stuff. But right now, I don't want to go there. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a judgment. But just be aware that if you don't deal with it today, it will potentially haunt you tomorrow. If you don't deal with it today, it'll potentially haunt you tomorrow. And it also worked for me. <laughs> so this shit works, I'm telling you. I love this quote, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service of others. I chased the money. I chased the financial freedom. I believed, and I was telling myself a story that with respect, I don't believe works. When I'm financially free, when I have the resources and the money, I'll then come back and figure out what I want to do when I grow up. I believe personally that that is fundamentally flawed. It was flawed for me. And no one said to me, or maybe they did and I wasn't ready to listen to it, is maybe you could do what you absolutely love. And the old cliche, I know it pisses some people off, it certainly pissed me off for a long time, that maybe the money will show up, who knows. And I don't mean show up magically on its own in a magic carpet. I'm talking about actually doing something to do it. And now I spend every single day doing what I love. Are there tough days? Of course. But it feels like yesterday I sat in an audience like this. And I'm not saying today I'm better than you. Actually, I'm saying the opposite. I'm the same. There's nothing better than me. Nothing better in my soul, in my heart, in my brain. My story's not better or more significant than yours. I don't have a greater tragedy than yours. My story is the most important story in the world to me right now. And for years it wasn't. So my invitation today is for you to stop making this journey about you and really saying, how can I serve the world? Maybe using my gift through the lens of my story. A number of years ago, I created a concept called One Last Talk. And I remember presenting this concept to a few people, and they said it's not going to work. And without boring the details, it is essentially I create a stage, I put speakers on the stage, 80% of the speakers have never stood in front of an audience and spoken publicly in their lives before. And 20% have. The whole idea is they get 15 minutes to give the one last talk they'll ever give before they leave this earth. 
So what it does, it creates not urgency, but I believe it focuses the mind and hopefully opens the heart. And I want to share a little story, a very important story about a little lady. And her name is Bev, and some of the guys here know Bev. And Bev is this tiny, tiny lady. But I think she's just got to, she's just got to be made of heart, because I've never, I don't think I've met many people in my life that have such a capacity to give so unselfishly and have such love for other human beings than this lady. And when I asked her to speak at one last talk, she said to me, me? me? You want me to speak? But what can I possibly speak about? What, what value could I possibly give? And what I do is I ask them to prepare their speech, come to a one last talk, retreat, like speaker retreat, and then we extract the story. And she did what a lot of people do. She came to that day and she spoke about something outside of herself. She spoke about you know, um, the, the atrocities or the challenges with the First Nations, and that's what she spoke about. And while I appreciate she's passionate about that, and I appreciate that that's important to her, I asked her to go deeper. I asked her to share part of her story, and of to which she said, but my story doesn't have value. How does my story relate? And she trusted me and herself and the room enough to stand on that stage in front of hundreds of people, and she shared the story <laughs> but the day she came home and found her son dead who just committed suicide with a gun. And you might say, okay, great, why did you encourage her to share a sad story? I'll tell you why, because she then went on to say, if I could turn back the clock, I wouldn't have cared as much about his scores, his academic ability. I wouldn't have been focused so much on building financial you know, wealth and freedom for the future. I would have been more present. I wouldn't have been at loss in technology. I would have held him more. I would have told him I loved him more. All the things that we don't get a chance to sometimes turn back the clock. And I went to the audience, I said, what are you gonna do? Like, what are you gonna do as a result of this talk? And people put their hands up and said, I'm gonna turn off my goddamn phone. I'm going to bring my daughter or my son on a date night. I'm just going to go home and hold them. And I look back on this stage, and this little lady sitting there in her stool, and I said, look at what you're doing. Look at the impact. And for the first time in her life, ever, she realized that she can let go of the shame and the guilt and the blame and the concerns and the questions of why, and realize that the pain that she has personally experienced has a purpose in this world now. You don't have to have experienced something so dramatic, but everybody in this room, I believe, has experienced pain. And what I'm saying to you today, and I'm inviting you to consider today, is that pain has a purpose beyond you holding it internally and allowing it to haunt you and hold you back that there is somebody on this earth that needs to hear that story. There is somebody that needs to hear that, and they don't even know they need to hear it, to know, if nothing else, that they're not alone, that they're not weird, that they're not odd. So what I want you to do is I want you to consider what would your one last talk be? What would you speak about? And I'm not asking you to identify something that lies outside of yourself. Some of you may believe global warming is the greatest catastrophe in the world. That it's going to haunt us if we don't do something about it. I appreciate that's important to you. I'm not asking for that. I want you to identify what is the one thing you would speak about. Share with the world, and I'm going to give you one little insight in, that may help you. Another gentleman shared a talk last year, and what he did was he approached and said, if I was giving this talk to my children, what would I say? It may be a truth that you haven't shared with another human being in the world. I'm not going to ask you to share it to me today. It may be something that you've yet to bring out of the closet that you think you've buried, but there's some part of you, most of your logic is saying it has no value. It can't possibly help anybody else, but there's a part of you that believes and feels that maybe it does. Maybe. I want you to identify what would you speak about right now. I'm going to give you a moment or two on that. Okay, everybody got it? 
again, the reminder is you're not trying to identify something that you believe, let's just say there's 100 people in the audience, 80% of them are going to love it. 20% are going to love it because I don't believe, like Bev, like myself, that we are the best person identifying how our stories have the capacity to impact other people. If we do that, if we wait till our story is perfect, if we wait till we have the perfect story, it'll never happen. I met a man one day in Vancouver and we were sitting in this big office and I was doing a keynote speech and after he comes out, he goes, oh, wow, he said, that was so cool. I'd love to do what you do. And I said, well, why don't you? He goes, oh, yeah, 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 I have an answer for that. He said, I had a very successful business. I lost it all through gambling and alcohol and drugs, and now I'm building it back up, and when I build a business, then I'll be ready. Such selfishness in the context of our stories. I brought him to the window. I didn't throw him out the window yet. I brought him to the window, and I said, look out there into Vancouver. There's alcoholics, there's gamblers, there's people who are blowing it, there's people who don't even know it yet, won't even admit they've got an issue, and you're standing here waiting for the perfect story until you then go and help the world? It's all about you, my friend, right now. It's about you looking good, you sounding great, you getting on a stage and getting whatever re response that you want and desire because of your insecurities which you've never dealt with. The day that you make this about other people is the day you deserve to get on that stage. That's when you deserve to get on that stage. So what is, what is your story? What is the thing that you're going to share? I'd like you to turn. So the first two rows turn to the person after you. I was working this out with my wife. And she says, when it gets to the back row, there'll be nobody there. And I said, OK, I'm not good in the detail. So the first two rows, the second two rows, whatever. Turn to somebody that you don't really know. I know you may be congregating around with people. But the person you know the least, find somebody. Don't go off for 20 minutes or whatever and have this conversation. Because I've only got another three and a half hours left to talk. So, <laughs> so turn to the person behind you and share. And what the, person that, what the person that's hearing and receiving you, I just want you to just be present. I just want you to listen to them. I don't want you to judge. I don't want you to coach them. I don't want you to say, oh, yeah, but I do this differently and I do that differently. That's not the purpose of this. Just be present to them. And don't be embarrassed. Just share the best you can. And if it's, a, if it's something dark, something you haven't shared before, a secret, whatever it happens to be, obviously be very respectful. Don't meet them in the bar later on. Go, I can't believe you shared that shit with me today. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Hey, John, you want to hear what this girl said? It's unbelievable. I thought I had some demons in the closet, but holy shit. <laughs> and you're going to share that in the world? God almighty. So listen, do that now, unless we're going to, I'll ask you to turn over in a minute. Let's go, please. If we get some music, that'd be fantastic, please. Okay, time. Let's just go back to your seats, please. Guys, if we can ask you to wrap up, please. Thank you. Is anybody listening to me? Please. Okay, everybody, let's go. <clears throat> okay, guys, thank you for that. I want a few people to share. Okay. Shh. Please, thank you. Okay, guys, so what I want to do is I want to get a couple of people to volunteer and share, okay? I, what I'm not looking for is someone to share, say, hey, yeah, I've always had this one last talk. It hasn't changed in 25 years. It's exactly the same today. That's, with respect, not a good use of time. I want someone to share something that came up for them and some, just, just share something. Lady over here. Come on, guys, maybe go to the mics. A couple of people go to this mic over here, please, and we'll share one at a time. If you got your hand up, the gentleman in the second row the, towards the back there, the lady in front of him, just go up to the mic, guys. Okay. Over in this mic here on my left, your right. Who'd like to go first? And um, very recently, what I'm acknowledging and wanting to share with all of you is just love yourself right now. <laughs> Who you are, where you are, what you look like. That would be my one last talk. Okay, so is that something you personally have struggled with? Absolutely. Do you still struggle with it? Um, yes or no? No. You I'm sure? working on it because... So in other words, yes. Okay. Okay? 
This is, this is where gray confuses us. With respect, it sounds yes, okay? And here's the great thing, and here's a big encouragement, okay? So last year, a gentleman got up on the, first, on the one last talk stage to share his talk. But before that, he struggled deeply with the story, the perfect bow. He said, but I don't have it all figured out. And I said, well, isn't that cool? Because you know what? There's a lot of people in the world who don't have it all figured out. He gets on stage. You know what the title of his talk was? Everything is awesome, not. <laughs> What immense courage to stand on a stage and say, guys, my life's in shit, but you know what? I'm trying to do something about it. Don't let go of the, 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 not the, not the need, but the invitation to be not just honest, but be vulnerable and face your truth. Because what that allows people to do is to relate to you, to feel it, that you don't have it all figured out. Thank you. Anybody else? Somebody over here, please. So guys, what I'm going to ask you to do is, everybody sharing is so incredible and so courageous. We'll do it at the end. I just want to be conscious of time. I want to hear as many people and respect them. So if I could ask you not to clap just in between, I'd really appreciate that. Gentlemen here, please. So the speech that I would, or the talk that I would give would be uh, why So can I, I ask you to do something for me? I know I'm, I'm pissing everybody off here. Can I ask you not to read this? Okay? Put your book down. Give it to the lady beside you there, please. I want to hear from here. Okay? And I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but of course I'm doing that. But <laughs> tell me what you would share with the world. Why I have the greatest mum in the entire world. Okay. All the men, I love that. <laughs> Why is that important to you? My mom, uh, she gave birth to me and my twin sister at nine weeks premature. We had a ton of health complications. My sister has anorex or had anorexia. She overcame that. Okay. I was supposed to die. So, okay, at okay, okay, okay. I, 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 I'm it's not. Just okay, no, no, okay, great. What you believe another human being could get from that story? What could they do as a result of that story? Look to their lives, find their challenges, and realize that they can't keep going. And appreciate their mothers along the way. Oh, yeah. Because I think that's, a, that's what I get from that. I'm not saying this is the message. What I'm getting from that is, you know what? Appreciate your mother along the way. Thank you very much. Lady over here. Hi, my name is Constance Pye, and I came from New York, and I didn't expect to meet you. And I'm pleased I did. Um, the talk that I have. Not many people say that, but thank you. <laughs> is I'm, I'm bat what I want to tell you is I'm battling with, I think, the story I'm telling myself about my talk. It's so sad. But um, sorry, because it's emotional for me. It sounds like your story is sad. No, it isn't, actually. It's a very positive story. But I've lost three people in the last three years. In the last eight years, my father, my mother, and my sister. It sounds like your story, so with respect, can I ask you just to, just to stop for a second? Number one, take a breath. Okay. It feels to me like your story is very sad. It's not. It's, hang on. It's also positive. I get that. Mm -hmm. There's no greater gift you can give yourself in the world by respecting both sides. I'm not trying to challenge, well, I am challenging, I'm not trying to create an argument here. What I'm saying is that when you honor the sadness, it allows you to impact other people in a much more effective way. And there's maybe a part of you that doesn't, you don't want this story to be sad because you've had so much sadness and you're trying to move beyond it. No. So continue, please. It, in a nutshell, my story is about the fact that your, that death is not about you and that most people bring their, fears and anxieties about what they're supposed to do about around death and that your ability to be present and to derive the, the beauty of the passing is in direct proportion to your ability to show up and be present. So that comes from my father who died in a car accident, my mother. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how much of your life do you live in your head, like very heady? Eight out of 10. Thank you, it was beautifully honest. Thank you for that. Trust me, I'm or... afraid of my heart. Yes, you are. Don't be afraid of your heart. It's the most beautiful part of you. It's the only part of you that the world needs to not just see, but feel. Allow the sadness to come up, because I know it's there, you don't agree, and when you disagree, I'm speaking to a brain, I'm speaking to a mind that's trying to control, because you're afraid, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you go down, you may never come back up because maybe the sadness might consume you. I don't necessarily need you to comment, nor am I trying to be right. If you get out of your head and into your heart and you share that story, you will move mountains for people. Maybe not millions of people. It could be, but it could be two people. But you really move them emotionally. Thank you. Guys, we're going to have to start wrapping up. I do apologize. Um, so I've had the pleasure of doing two calls with you over the past month, and you actually asked me this question, and I had no idea how to answer. And 
I just went through the exercise again and it hit me. I'm like, if I was going to die tomorrow, um, the talk that I would give would be all about stepping towards my fears. So this is something that I've started doing. Um, I'm a very cautious person and, you know, I'm scared of flying. So I took a flying lesson last week. So what's the fear you want to step towards? Right now it's stepping towards any fear. Any fear that let's I pick, have Let's pick one. Through. Let's pick one. Okay. What is it? The next fear. Uh, public speaking is one of them, and that's why I also came up. Facing you was another one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I'm not kidding. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. So public speaking, okay. So when are you going to do your first speech? Um, actually, Natalie McNeil asked me to speak at... When are, you, when are you going to do it? Give me it's, a day. Uh, in 2017. Fantastic, okay. So, guys, I'm going to have to leave it there. So, um, something came up there a second ago, and it's just completely gone. That's okay. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have time to get work, so we're out of time. But I want to read something to you. So, guys, if I could ask you to sit down, I do apologize. No, I've got to, I, want to, I have to respect the time, because if the next speaker, it's, it's, the guys have a tight schedule, so I, I've got to respect the teacher. Um, so, what I want to do is, um, I, want to, I want to share a poem that's very important to me. Uh, I do write some poetry, but this is not a poem that I wrote, so it's a poem that I believe speaks to exactly the very thing that I've attempted to get across here today. And what I'd ask you to consider is, how are you going to execute on the one last talk? You might want to go to a school, you may want to do a blog post, you may just want to share with your family, you may just want to share with your kids. The amount of parents that, are, that, that just show and express very little vulnerability, or it's very controlled vulnerability to their kids because they don't want to be seen as being weak. What I would encourage you to consider is, what are you going to do with this? Okay, I'm not going to tell you what to do, it has to come from you. But here's the one I, I want to read this poem, and I'm, I'm not great at reading, I'm dyslexic, so I do apologize if, it's, if, it's, if I mess it up. I probably have to read this a thousand times just so I could read it in public, um, so, so just bear with me. It's called The Seasick Sailor and Others. The awkward young sailor who, who is always seasick is the one who will write about ships. The young man whose soldiery consists in the delivery of candy and cigarettes to the front is the one who will write about war. The man who will never learn to drive and keeps going home to his mother is the one who will write about the road. Stranger still, Hardly anyone else will write so well about the sea, or the war, or the road. And then there is that woman who has scarcely spoken to a man, except her brother, and who works in a room no larger than a closet. She will write as well as anyone who's ever lived about the vast open spaces and the desires of the flesh. And that other woman, who will live with her sister and rarely leaves her village, will excel in portraying men and women in society. And that woman, in some ways, the most wonderful of all, who is afraid to go outdoors, who hides when someone knocks, she will write great poems about the universe inside her. Making a difference is not for the few, it's for you. Thank you very much indeed.